Welcome to the Grow Your Business podcast. Listen in as we discuss all things business, growth and marketing with business owners, thought leaders and entrepreneurs. And now, here's your host, founder of Roundhouse, the creative agency, Saul Edmonds. Oh, hi, everyone, and welcome to the Grow Your Business podcast. Today, I'm speaking with Mark van der Bugart about the topic uh, well, I guess we'll call it a topic, side hustling, a side hustle, um, coaching, hunting and podcasting and probably just about anything else we want to talk about. Um, so, Mark, you're, uh, you're into a lot of different stuff and this is going to be pretty interesting. So what do you have to say for yourself about this topic? Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do <laughs> is I'm going to say, though I've known you for 50 years, so my name is Mark Vanden Bogart. Oh, whatever. So that's, a, that's the first thing I'm going to say. So, with that out of the way, let's, let's crack this. Uh, let's crack this egg. So, um, who are you, Mark? So, just oh, okay. So, as, like as a framework, guy. as a framework first, framework. so we don't just like dive straight into abstract mm. philosophical conversation. So, people have some idea of of like who you are, generally what you do to provide a helpful framework for the audience listening. Sure. So uh, my name is Mark Van Bogart. I am a Gen X 50, what, four-year-old? That's how old old we are, Uh, business owner. I live here in Brisbane. I'm a family man. I have a lovely wife and two um, golden boys who uh, give me great fulfillment in my life. In terms of, uh, well, I've been told that the, Eldest looks like me. The youngest looks like my wife. However, the traits are not equally distributed. So my yeah. oldest has a number of traits that are very much like my wife, whereas the youngest has lots of traits that are like me. So I suppose that's the joy of um, of of the gene pool. Yeah, exactly. So that's part of it. And from a business point of view, um, For the last 10 years, I've worked as an executive coach across big business, um, so corporations, uh, government, uh, both uh, state and federal. I don't think I've ever worked for local. Um, And more recently, not-for-profit. So I've had Mm. an engagement with not-for-profits now for a number of not-for-profits running for a few years. But that doesn't, uh, I don't, I haven't, disregarded the other clients it's just a really a spreading of the client base and what i do with those uh, in that in that particular role is i provide executive coaching to executive leaders uh senior leaders and uh up and coming leaders or emerging leaders and um if i was to describe my approach to coaching um this might sound a little bit eclectic but then again it's probably a, a good way to describe myself mm. there's two types of um uh skills as far as i can see in the world the way we look at skills we either look like uh, skills that you inherit you inherit they're a part of you so you might and i call that um that's harry potter magic you're you're either born a wizard or you're not <laughs> um uh, yeah but and that's really great one too Remember that's right wand. and that's and that's great if you are a wizard, but it's not so great if you're not. Uh, the other type of magic is what I call practical magic, which is pen and teller, which means really what we're talking about here is, is practicing, refining and developing skills over a period of time where they appear to be magical. Mm. And I'm very much about helping people develop practical mag- magic in, in, the, in the realm of leadership. So how they lead themselves and how they lead with and through others. That's really my anchor point. I like those metaphors. That's a good one, especially the pen and teller one. It's like the uh, the aspect, I suppose, too, which I've, I haven't actually watched pen and teller for a while, but I do, that's the one thing that I always like about them is, well, not with everything that they do, but the fact that some of it's then sort of explained, but they don't explain everything because of course that would ruin it but they explain enough to to give people like this really interesting insight into the mechanics of 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 how how it actually unfolds very much so so you know that what you're watching is 
they're not selling it as magic, but what you're watching is you're watching, you know, people who are world leaders in their field. And what they're also telling you is, I think, skillful. Time and again, what they're telling you is that you can become that. You know, so it's not something that is, uh, oh, that's only that's only available for the people who are born with it. Um, that's mm. that wonderful idea that, you know, capability and competence can be developed over time through practice and through experimentation and, and you know, success and failure and learning from failure, but you can achieve that. So, and leadership is is just another one of those skills. You can learn how to be a, you know, you can say, oh, they're, they're a born leader, which is great for them. But for the rest of us who aren't born leaders, there is an option, which is learn. Is there and a coral? It is there a correlation? Because that that idea of like being, say, a born leader, I've often correlated that same, I guess, interpretation of that with those people who appear to be like naturally good at at, at certain like sporting skills, and I've sort of seeing that like people, um, for example, in um, like your know, martial arts, like there's people who who start at a white belt and for whatever reason, just genetically or the fact that they've like watched heaps of Bruce Lee movies or something, I don't know, but they're, they're just like naturally really good at certain sorts of things. But then it doesn't, but my observation is that it doesn't then necessarily always follow that then they become exceptional at martial arts like it it does sometimes but then there's this this other element of like i guess maybe you'd say like a willingness to learn you know if you're talking about um you know leadership being a learned skill would you would you think like my my observation about like skills in general is there has to be outside of just learning but there has to be like a real willingness to learn, like and and to and and to push past like that point where it's comfortable. Yeah, look, I think I think you know it, we're talking about I suppose dispositions, and you can have a disposition genetically, physically, intellectually to towards something, and we probably all do have that. We have a genetic yeah, disposition no towards that. Um, however, that's not that's the start. That's not the end game, and you know, and that's why you know um, you might say that you look at someone and go, oh, you know, look at look at them physically or intellectually or or, or what it, or a combination of both. But what you don't see is the dedication and the you know the, the 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 hard work and the reconciling failure and you know and and celebrating success you don't see that you just see the outcome mm. so you tend so we tend to see things you know in because we don't see time we see you know we see a point in time we don't see we don't see timelines we see points in time so we tend to think that that's how it is and that's kind of how it always has been that way you know and we and for instance if you've got um, family or friends and they've got children and you don't see those children for some period of time, then you see them and they, they're they fundamentally different. You kind of go, oh, look at you. You know, you're different. And, but if you saw them every day, you would see the timeline of progression. You just see that that point of time. Yeah, so exactly. it doesn't, it does certainly having a, a disposition towards something um, is beneficial at the beginning, but I don't think it's necessarily beneficial at towards the end. And even that disposition doesn't even have to be, uh, for instance, um, uh, I suppose, inherited. So you can have um, exposures or you can have learnings of, of relevant learnings, but if you don't allow those learnings to keep developing, you kind of get stuck in, you know, stuck in time. Yeah. Um, I remember, for instance, before I, before I, so a long, long time ago, when after I left school, I became an apprentice, and I was uh, in a, a trade that was um, a, a pretty uh, high tech trade, as it were. And you know, when we went to TAFE to do a block release, which is the way that they used to run it back then. So for seven weeks every year, you went to TAFE full time. So you became a full time student for seven weeks. 
And once we got past a certain level of um, fundamentals within the, the trade that we're in, what became apparent is that a lot of the trade teachers didn't know as much as the emerging technology as the people who were there because they learnt and refined their learning and then went to 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 to, to TAFE and into teaching. And it wasn't as alive in a live environment as everyone who was coming in. Mm. So there was this kind of like, and you can imagine that once upon a time they were probably, you know, the top tradesmen within their trade and they mm. said oh look you come here and you tr you train young people and make them better tradesmen and there was probably a period of time where that worked but over a period of time if they weren't if they didn't keep up or in actually try and stay in front of what was happening there was this real um i suppose disconnect and so that can happen so for instance in leadership roles more than a more than a couple of times i've, I've coached people who have used a certain technique or a certain approach to get them to a point, but now they've actually found that that technique or that approach is no longer relevant because they're in a different environment. Mm. So, you know, it gets you a certain way, but they, they kind of mastered a level one, but now they're in level two and level two is very different. Yeah. Do you think that that's um, like some of that has to do with, like say with the example of if you're, if you're, a teacher there's like certain um frameworks and restrictions placed upon you with the curriculum that you're given to teach as opposed to then the person who's got the curriculum who they're given to teach but they they still actually are like uh maybe like more passionate or their general predisposition is is to is to like expand upon that even more even though they've only been told to do like X, Y, Z, that they're actually going to do more anyway. So like, do you think um, my general observation, I suppose too, is that some of that comes down to like people's general disposition about um, maybe how passionate they are or that they feel, even though like, say like in your example, like they, they um, are behind the eight ball in terms of like current trends and, everything else that despite that they're still going to try to inject um, something else into it anyway? Yeah, well, I think that what that comes from is from a personal approach to learning. I think yeah. that it's, it's you know, it, it's fundamental to have a personal approach to learning. Now, and I think the, the really important part of that is that it's personal. So you, how you like to learn, how you, you know, is is really important to who you might be helping, but more importantly, it's more important to you. Mm. Um, and so, you know, you, you, it's the sporting analogies are always, you know, a, a goal mine for coaching. Uh, so you look at someone yeah. like Jonathan Thurston, he played on the same field as everyone else, but he appeared to play it a different way. Mm. He still had the same rules, the same structures, you know, the the distances, the, you know, the boundaries, the rules, the, the fundamentals were the same, but he seemed to play it a different way. Um, and you know you get that, and and so you also get this. Um, what another another sporting analogy I use is is like someone like Mike Hussey, who, when he came onto the Australian international scene, it was like this revelation. This guy appeared out of nowhere, and he just came out of nowhere, and he was you know just having a fantastic batting average and all that stuff. The thing is, he didn't come out of nowhere. Nowhere he'd been playing at uh, what they call you know first class or level cricket for for years on those same fields against the same players but in a different situation so really for him it was just he put a different hat on that day but you know it was the same yeah. it was you know he'd, he'd been constantly refining his skills and developing his skills and improving and so it was just oh okay i'm in a different i'm in a different role and that's something that I, I often talk to people who are in senior or coming into a senior or even an executive or in some cases a CEO role is that the best CEO in the world has something in common with the newest CEO in the world and it's not the title CEO. It's the fact that both of them once upon a time in their life weren't, weren't a CEO. Mm. You know, you no matter how good you are, there is a time in your life when you're not there. Mm, and, you know, so and so technically on Sunday you go to bed and on Monday you wake up <laughs> and you're the CEO. And so there, so everyone has that transition. And so how you 
prepare yourself for that transition before you get to the transition is really important. So, you know, and that's that's you know, those, some of those really, uh, you know, foundational uh, leadership ideals of, you know, practice being a leader. Yeah, well, there seems yeah. to be, there's an emerging, um, uh, sort of an emerging theme, which I suppose we could uh, apply, get your thoughts on other things that you'd like to do too, the theme being of, of sort of learning and like methods by which you actually, by why um, willingness, how people learn, their learning style. And then I'd like to say in, in the, uh, the coaching sphere in the executive coaching sphere is it is it true to say that like from what what you do with people like the way you work is it um or i guess how important i should ask how important is it for you to identify like those methods by which people learn like at, at an early stage oh most definitely um the you know we look at you know i suppose um indicators of success in terms of executive coaching there's two that readily come to mind is one that i i I engage with this person as a person i don't engage with them as you know um the the chief executive officer or, or i don't engage with them as the managing director of hr or something like that i don't engage with that I, or you know they're the chief engineer or some a title i engage with them as a person and understanding them as a person and i suppose that and over time developing a, a, a skill to be able to at the very least figure out um quickly how to to build connection with that person is 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 you know is vital the second part of that the the, the you know the the the, the the other part of that two-part epoxy is that the person wants to learn. If the person doesn't, so when I look at coaching um, and I think about it, and, and I'm going to use another metaphor here because ultimately I think I'm a storyteller more than anything, um, is that when I look at how people approach or how people feel about, you know, their, their development needs, there's a kind of, there's a, a, an analogy I use, which is that the, it's about being lost. Mm. And if you think about it, you know, we use the term I'm lost a lot, but, you know, um, you might use it, for instance, you're in your car and you're driving in a new suburb. So they've opened up a whole new suburb behind where you live and you, you go down to explore it and you just kind of go on. I don't know any of this. I don't know any of this. I don't know any. Anyway, so technically, you're lost. But then you see something. Maybe it's a geographic. Um, you, you know, it's a it's a it's a it's a hill. It's a tower. It's something like that, or it's a street sign. But all of a sudden, you go, oh, I know where I am now. And for some, for a lot of people, their development is finding that point of reference. So mm. they kind of go, I don't know really what to do here, and they're kind of. They kind of go, I'm lost, I'm lost. I'm like, oh, okay, now here's a re- point of reference. And so you can start on a point of reference. So helping that person is helping them identify that point of reference. Yeah. The second type of person is a person who just um, needs momentum, you know. They need to move, you know. And so because the path is not laid out in front of them, they've, they've stopped. But the thing is we know that often the best way to solve something is to, to start moving because if you're moving, you can kind of go, well, maybe I'm not going the right direction, but now I can change because I've got momentum. So, you know, it, it's a, it's yeah, a kind at of, least um, you know, then that's yeah. right. It's a, it's a learning and using feedback. You go, well, I thought I was going these, but really I'm not, but you know, you use feedback and you get, you get more and more refined. The hardest person to, to, to connect with from a coaching point of view or from a learning point of view is a person goes, I know it. Yeah, I do that. Yeah, we do that. I've, I've read that. Da, da. So the person who says, no, everything's fine, that's actually the hardest person to to breach. So from a mm-hmm. from an executive coaching point of view, from, an, from a success point of view, the person that I'm coaching needs to want to be there. If mm-hmm. it's not, it's it's some very uncomfortable time. <laughs> yeah, no, well, I mean, that's that that's, I would imagine that everybody listening would, would just intuitively <laughs> understand like anyone that says if 
if you're there, well, specifically if you're there to assist and then someone says, I don't need any assistance, you know, it's it's hard then to move forward. But I guess that gets back to just that general idea across just about, I think, you know, everything that I can think of, not just coaching or sport, but like, you know, lots of different activities is willingness. You know, you got yeah. to have, you have to have to have to be willing like to give it a go. And that's where I'm like, we were saying before, like the people who, um, I mean, this is, I know it's a bit of a, a broad brush to paint that doesn't apply to everything, but I've, I've often found, I mean, with myself, I suppose too, like, you know, but looking at other people, like people who are less, who say aren't as either genetically or just predisposed to something that they're good at, um, you know, who reach a certain point and they feel they don't have to try as hard as opposed to somebody who's who's always had to struggle um, and they've had to struggle and they've kept struggling because they got willingness to do that are, are often going to be the people who, you know, um, actually succeed because they're going to stick it out, you know, in, in the long run or, or, mm. or they're going to be more likely to. Um, it doesn't mean it's no it's no answer that they're going to, but they might be more likely to. But then again, there's like there's all sorts of shades of grey in that too. There's like people that are genetically, you know, or predisposed to something that are naturally good, who then become super successful because they're also like super motivated. Hmm. And so, well, I think it, 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 it's always you know what we're looking at there is we're looking at the um, the indicators or pillar pillars of potential success Mm. you have to do something with them they in themselves won't do it you know they won't do it for you so you know and i I am i don't but i am sure that the history of you know any um sport is littered with people who had the potential but didn't convert it for whatever reason and you know they just they had, had everything but they no, they didn't actually have everything. So I'm sure that's a, the case. And I know for myself, and I think a big part of this again is what and when I look at coaching and and when I work with people, um as a coach, I need to understand that, or I need to work a way to understand that because I need to understand the person. Again, mm-hmm. I need to focus on a person. But I know even for myself, the way I you know, I usually say that I don't. It takes me about ten years to get good at anything. You know, I'm, I, you know, <laughs> I people say that. ten. People say the ten thousand hour and things like that. That they're all just ways of describing things. For me, it's about ten years, and I can't remember. I can't remember his name for the life of me. But the 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 um, uh, actor, musician slash comedian who played Kenny. Kenny. Yeah, the the the, the plumber. Oh, the, I can't oh, remember. Shane, yeah. Shane, 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 somebody. Yeah, he wrote a book. Guy. He wrote a book at something, something along the lines that you know, uh, it took me ten years to be an overnight success, <laughs> and that that's kind of it. You know, it, I feel that in terms of, um, in terms of personal professional development, we're talking about compounding interest. So you mm. know, you've got to, you know, for a while it's it's cents, and then it gets to multiple cents, and then it gets to dollars, and then. And then it seems to accelerate, and I think that's what happens. You have compounding interest. Yeah. And so you've got to be willing to kind of, you know, like as again, you know, when we were both kids, you know, and the Commonwealth Bank used to have a school account, and it was it was a dream that if you put in a tiny bit of money every week, eventually it would come true. Now, let's be honest, it probably didn't come true, but that was the dream, you know, the Spent idea that this, this is – this is a compounding outcome. If you keep going, you get better. Um, and, you know, and you become more aware of how you can deal with a challenge. Uh, you And so when you get challenges, and this is a, a you know, a, an interesting sidebar is that one of the big things that when I, when I work with people in this space is that often people say that they lack confidence or and or they use a word like confidence, you know, to describe the same thing. And even some people say, "Look, I believe that I that I suffer from imposter syndrome, which is a mm. a pretty top topical, you know, idea." And um, 
along my journey, I studied psychology, specifically behavioral science. And one of the things I remember most from my, my psychology degree, other than the fact that I was in a room with people who were way smarter than me, <laughs> was that don't make diagnosis. You know, do you're not, you're not, your job is not to diagnose. Diagnosis and diagnostics is an art in itself, and you just don't see something and, and make a diagnosis. Um because you're you're likely to 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 misread it, and what I feel with things like imposter syndrome, and when when someone says that, or they say, "Look, I think I you know I suffer from imposter syndrome, or I'm not confident in my job, or something like that," what you find is if you break that down and you say, "Okay, so let's talk about your job," so and they go, "Okay," and that, and I say, well, "What do you do?" and things like that, and we go, "So I might say, so in your job." How much of your job is you're working on autopilot? That is, you've got no concern whatsoever that you will not achieve that particular outcome. Mm. And for most people who's been in a, in a job for any period of time, that's like 80, 90% of their work. Mm. You know, they know 80, 90. So I say, well, okay. So there's, and then I say, okay, so how much of your job is this is going to be damn hard, but we're going to make it? So, you know, we're going to work late. We're going to, you know, time frames are going to be compressed. We're going to come awfully close to cutting the budget. You know, we all would, you know, it's, it's, we're, it's going to be tough, but we're going to make it. And, you know, it might be okay. It might be five to 10%. So immediately you get to the fact that for most people, about 90 to 95% of the time in their job, they know they're going to make it. Mm. So this time that they, they're an imposter is actually a very, very small part of their day or their week or their month or whatever the cycle of their work is. But the trouble is what we tend to do is we tend to disregard or devalue the measure of success that we have in our lives and over overvalue, overemphasize and overmeasure those challenges. What do you think that so, is? I do. Well, there's lots of different reasons. I think one of it's it's uh, one of it. I think it's it's it, it's a Western trait, you know. And especially, um, uh, I I mean, I don't have a great deal of um, uh, working experience overseas, but I know in Australia, you know, if you do something well, people go, yeah, you, you know, if you give someone a compliment, they'll go, yeah, whatever, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah it's my job. Just do my job, mate. Don't yeah, don't make, yeah, don't blow don't blow smoke on me. You know, we'll actually kind of not dislike it but we will we mostly will devalue yeah it's just that's what i do mate yeah it's an implied it's sort of this like implied thing that you're showing off even though that's not spoken yeah. but it's like eh, yeah, then i'll worry about it that's all right yeah that's all you know oh, mate, no big deal it's my job it's no big deal mate it's not big deal. so if someone you know if you're at a if you're at a at a, at a some you know at a, at a, at a, at a, at a social event and you know Someone does something at that social event, and you, you know the the way they've set it up, some you know, whatever it is, and you go, man, this is great fun. They go, yeah, you know, this is just this is just this is a normal Saturday type. Thing. Yeah, let's do it all the time. And you know, it's not a normal Saturday. You know, they, <laughs> people, you know, it's not. They they've put effort, thought, you know, money, time, all into that to make it enjoyable, and it's worked. And you and you and you and you uh, and you give them compliment on that, and they just they just kind of. Turn a little bit to the side and brush it off. Now, if the event didn't work, and I don't mean like catastrophically didn't work, but it just didn't come off as they envisioned it, they'd chew over that for days, if not weeks. You know, mm. like, oh, you know, I should have done this, I should have done that, and this, A should have been before B, and D should have been before one, you know, and, and, and that's what we do. We too, so we do that work. So, you know, most people I speak to are. Uh, uh, people in executive roles. And unless it's a situational coaching, so, and I'll explain that. So generally coaching either follows two formats, what's called a situational coaching, like something has gone wrong and I've been asked to come in to talk someone, but that's mm. actually a very, very small component of my, my gig. Mm. Nearly always it's someone is doing something well and we want them to do something better. Mm. Okay. And so expand upon, being, expand upon we've, what they're we've promoted person A to a new role, and we want them, we want you to help them master the role like they mastered the previous ones. So that's a de developmental coaching approach. Okay. So there's situational and developmental. Now, 
95% of the people I coach are in a you know, what you might call the de- developmental uh, pillar or mm. pipeline. Very few times do I coach people in a situational one. Now, by the fact that I've walked into, to, by the fact that an organisation has engaged me to talk to you, tells me that you're pretty good at your job. Mm-hmm. So even now I know, before I even lay eyes on you, that you're, you know, you're at about 80% at least in terms of success. Mm-hmm. So if, if you're in a job and you're holding that job and no one, you know, you're not in a position where you may lose that job because of your performance, conversely, if that's the case, then you're probably doing at least an 80% you're hitting 80%. Now, you go, well, I should be hitting 100% or 90%. But but if you think about 80%, 80% is a chunk of stuff. You know, it's a it's a big chunk of it, of of um of measurement of performance. So most people are doing that. Most people are acting at a pretty high level to start with. That's why they're there but in we, the first place. But for us, that's that unfortunately, the way you know we think that becomes baseline. Mm. That becomes baseline, and so if I'm not at eighty percent, you know I'm not performing. So you you kind of invariably shift your own baseline on yourself, and 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 so you get to a point where maybe your your measures of yourself or the measures of what you see and do it might be a little bit unrealistic for yourself. In the sense that your standards increase once you reach the next level. Yeah, that's right. So as, as something becomes, you know, easier for you, you know, you, um, you, you know, you invariably kind of the baseline rises. Mm. Yeah, I guess there's a, it, it just sort of occurred to me, I'm thinking about a, a, a sport metaphor, but once again, I think it applies to this too, that if you, if you've got, say, if you've reached a certain level, you know, say if we use a metaphor of like uh, a video game, you reach a certain standard and you've worked like very, very hard to reach that level and you know you're able to do it, but you, but then you haven't done it enough that you can consistently perform yet at that same level over and over and over again. So like you, in your mind, you're like, I'm at this level so would you say, or um, what's your, your view on, say, people who have reached a certain standard and mentally they're like, I'm, I'm here, but then is, is there more frustration and anxiety that creeps in than when people, um, you know, say shortly after they aren't quite as good at that level as they thought they were, but mentally they're like, I'm here now, but they... Um, it's more frustrating, which I guess would make sense um, unless you've been then at that level for X amount of years or or months and you're consistently good at those particular skills or whatever it is that, you know, um, that maybe wouldn't require um, someone like you to assist them, like in, in that context. I'm like, what yeah. do you think about that? Is is there more? Is there even even more frustration that creeps in? And is that is that consistent across the board, or is that like with only certain sorts of people? Look, I think um, again, it comes down to the individual, but there is certain kind of uh, themes that run through that, and and one of the key themes is that we're really terrible of measuring ourselves. Mm. Because we have to, you know, we we have to live with it. So we're really terrible at it. Yeah. Um, you know, we're the person we speak to the most. You know, and um, and you know, so we tend to everything for us is outward, except for when we actually consciously or subconsciously think about ourselves. But that's not a particularly effective measure. That's not a good way of measuring something. You know, we actually, we know that if we want to measure something, objectivity in the measurement is is the most important thing. Yeah. Because if it isn't, then we kind of go, oh, you know, like if if I, if someone creates a survey and we, you know, if, 
you know, let's let's look at some of the hysterical historical stuff. You know, like the the, the smoking lobby produces documentation. That smoking is good for you. Smoke it three times a day, and you know, we know. Well, you mean it's not? We know <laughs> that that's. We know that's a, that, that's it. We know that there is a, uh, uh, you know, we know that it's wrong. You know, so if it, and or, or when someone does a report and you read it, and, it, and it's you know, it's it's. You know, like political commentary that you see now, you know, more and more in, in, in the online print media, you know. So this article bashes one political party and you get down to the bottom and it's written by someone else in the other political party. And we go, oh, come on. We're kind of the same. You know, we know that if we really want to measure something, we have to be objective. The trouble is when we measure ourselves, we're not objective. Mm. You know, we're, we're the least objective person. So it's really important, no matter how you measure those things, that you get objective, you get input from others or from other sources that helps balance that. You know, so you can't, you cannot be the arbiter of your own performance. You have to get, and one way of doing that is actually to recognize other things around you. So, um, you know, actually recognizing, you know what? When such and such said to me that I did a good job, maybe they meant it. <laughs> uh, you know, maybe maybe they were actually telling the truth. Uh, and that's why I think it's so important, um, and I, I did this today, just, just it's so important that if you hear someone praising someone, obviously for a good thing, you know, we don't want to, we don't, that you not only you you actually go back to the person who is giving the praise and give them praise for doing it. Mm. So today I literally went to some, I was at a board meeting and I went to the, one of the board members and say, hey, look, one of the team um, was really chuffed that you recognised them in that meeting last week to make it kind of ubiquitous and that no one could identify the conversation. And I already knew that the person who received the feedback glowed when they got feedback because they told me, but also the person, you know, when the person who gave that initial feedback heard that, they also glowed too, you know. Mm. It's like it's so it's really important that when someone gives praise and you and you secondhand learn of that to actually praise the person who did it because it's so easy to do and it is so fundamentally um, influential. Mm. You influence you, you it's you know allowing someone to hear that they've done a good job and then even their acts you know in any way so even if their action is to praise others is is fundamental so when you're measuring yourself and look um we do a, a number of the coaching assignments we do we'll, we'll do a um like a baseline type of 360 degree test type thing you know and some people by their very nature nature you know are harsh markers and some people are more you know generous markers and when you talk to those people and this is either about themselves or about other people the harsh markers saying say like you know i do it for encouragement okay and when you talk to the people who are who may be on the other side who are maybe um you know a, a little too much praise worthy you ask them what they do. I do it for encouragement. Mm. You know, you know. I I I gave him a hard mark because I want to motivate him. I gave <laughs> Which him a great mark because I want to motivate him. You know, and and that's it's the thing. kind of not really objective, then, is it? No, not at all. No, but you you got it. So 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 when you measure yourself, if you're measuring yourself. And, and one of the things I say to people is so if someone has a report and we go through the report and at the end of it, I can see they're, they're a little perplexed and, you know, because there's a really, really, they've really slammed themselves. And that's often the case. So you with a 360, I'm not sure if you understand a 360, but, you know, it, it's different inputs. For, uh, around. It's the same questions put to different people. So you get like themes. So it might be mm -hmm. your manager, it might be your customers, it might be your peers, it might be the people you report to. Part of it's you as well. So there's all these trend lines. And someone who's on the a bottom of the trend line or someone in the top of the trend. So when people are kind of in the middle, they're okay. You know, oh, I'm kind of in the middle. But if they're at the top, they go, oh, maybe I'm too soft on myself. And, you know, or on the trend, maybe I'm too hard on myself. And I say to them, it's the same thing. It's the same with, with any kind of praise. It's the same thing. 
if by being hard on yourself, you find that motivates you to greater outcome or success, that's a great thing. Um, if you feel that giving yourself praise motivates you to greater outcomes and greater success, that's a great thing. But if either too high or too low gets in the way, then you need to think about that. Mm. So if too high means that you have expectations that don't aren't realised, you need to think about that. If too low means you don't take a chance because you believe your ex expectations will not be realised, you need to think about that. Mm. You don't want your measures to get in your way. You want your measures to, to motivate. There's an awful lot of, sounds like there's an awful lot of um, psychology involved <laughs> in sort of, um, but at the end of the day too, I guess it's just a lot of um, uh, sort of observation and, and understanding about people too, you know, at, at the heart most of these things. Yeah. There's like people are, you know, there's like such a wide gamut of different sorts of people with people's you know and all the combinations of their motivations their their upbringing and any number of things but you know at least if you can get to the the heart of certain things you know creating like you were saying before like you you feel like you're um uh, describe yourself as a as a storyteller which i i find really interesting too that i know that you're uh you can tell people a little bit about like some of your um, um, some of your writing and involvement with um, various magazines too. So like in not only in the context of like actual writing, but like the the storytelling of weaving a story. Um, maybe even like it just sort of occurred to me that there's an element of um, just think of the right term like almost co-creation of a story maybe as a, a coach because you're involved in in somebody's story and, and you're assisting them, like not a, a equal level of co-creation, but because you're then injecting yourself as like a character, like inside their story, you know, in, I mean, in a way, like a metaphor like that. No, because um, I'm liking like, it. I'm liking it a lot. There's I'm nothing. There's I'm nothing like a I'm, good metaphor. There's nothing like a good metaphor. Oh, I no, no, right no. And I, I, I have to admit, I'm, I'm known for them. Um, <laughs> yeah, I am too. Yeah, I, I maybe uh, like from, you know, metaphors. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, like most design and art is like, they're they're flying around everywhere. You can't get rid of the damn things. They're like buzzing around like flies. Like metaphors everywhere. But like that idea of of being of you saying you feel like you're you know being like a storyteller, I found really interesting because people often associate uh, associate that, and that's like a real catch phrase right now in the branding and design industries. This idea of storytelling, and and it should be rightly so. I mean, it's true, but it's it's used. But you saying it is interesting because like I know that you. I, I never really, um, I guess, made the connection between like your interest in writing, obviously about something that you really, I mean, I love when it comes like the hunting and that whole sort of industry. And then like the fact that you obviously like telling those stories and sharing them with people and talking and I guess like sort of in a way because stories are, are reliving experiences too. But then if you can participate in somebody else's story, it's, I mean, I always found it's, you know, incredibly rewarding um, helping anyone out, but in a way that is like you're injecting yourself, like I'm another little character who's playing this role in your story. And, and that can like end up, end up like going down any number of narratives you know, or one usually, but sometimes, you know, it goes down some other path. It's unexpected. And that's exciting too. I mean, I, I always really like that. But uh, do you want to tell people a little bit about? Oh, well, I think, well, yeah, that, I was, I'm just processing what you said. To be honest. <laughs> but look, I suppose to give that some context of what you just said then, I think for me, storytelling is the mechanism 
Mm. What I really like about working with people in coaching, but more broadly I've found throughout my life, is I like seeing people succeed. Mm. So sometimes I give them ideas about success mechanisms, so you might achieve it through this way. But for some people, it's about allowing them just to see the opportunity for success. Mm. So but for me, what I get, I, I've never particularly wanted to be out front. So, but I, 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 I get great joy in seeing people succeed. Um, so there's that. That's kind of, I think, where the coaching uh, comes from. Um, the, the behavioral science, I think, is just giving, has given me and, and practicing that behavioral science for a number of years has just given me a, a refinement of skill. But ultimately, the, the, the way in which I, which, which I do help people is I try to weave a story and I try to weave a story that they're the character. So, mm. you know, I'm not a narrator by any means, but I want them to see themselves as the as the lead within their within their within their journey. I, I, I want them to see that what they're doing is actually directly contributing to their success. So I don't want anyone to think, oh, my success came from someone else. Now, it, obviously it does, but I don't want them to disregard their own part in, in that journey. So I don't want them to kind of feel that, oh, it's, you know, and and, and that gets back to that, that original idea about magic, you know, in that, you know, the way that we see magic is that some people are born with it, which is great unless you're not. So what I want to say is that it doesn't matter. That doesn't matter as much as what you envisage and what you want to strive towards and what you want to drive towards. Um, so I think that's a big part of it. Now, I suppose more broadly in, in the storytelling world, um, there's, you know, there's lots and lots of parts in my life where that that kind of I suppose, again, getting back to those idea of measures, when I look back and kind of go, okay, that's what you're doing. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty, you know, if you if you follow our advice, you're probably a storyteller because, boy, you're telling stories all the time. Mm. So, you know, and, um, yeah, and good it, energize, mm. it, it, it energizes me rather than it draws upon my energy, which is always also a really good under, a good way to determine if you really like something. If it, if it draw, if you feel that it drains you, you probably don't like it. If you feel that it energizes you, it's probably good. And so people, yeah, that's a good measure. Know, that's, that's it. So what energizes you and what drains your energy? So for me, a big part of what energizes me um, is that I've, for as long as I can remember, always wanted to live an outside life. And um, I have a big chunk, I have done that for a big chunk of my life. Um, you know, even from, you know, a very early age, I, I, I wanted, I was, I've been outside and I've been exploring and I've been doing um, and it's not because my family were, you know, uh, it came from a family. It was always uh, something that drove myself. And one of the the big things that I, for whatever reason, and this is very difficult to explain, I can give justifications for it, but I don't ever think they explain the why is that. I felt a strong connection to the outside world through hunting. And people often are a bit shocked by that. Hmm. One, because hunting is not such a thing that we think about anymore, though, you know, that's only a fairly recent thing in the history of the world. But the thing is, um, I have well, for a long time now, I've 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 hunted um and about oh, 2008, 2000, 2007, 2008, I was literally reading a magazine. Uh, and they said, "Yeah, you know, tell us about your hunting stories." And I and I wrote a story, and and it went from there. And and over that period of again, so what that that's fifteen years. Um, 
So there's that 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 model of success that takes at least ten years. I've become yeah. more and more well. Uh, I, well, one one is I've become a better writer, and two I've become more well read. And so um, I, I, I I'm published regularly. Um, and now, most recently, I've picked up a column. Um, I replaced a gentleman who retired after 35 years in, in, in a magazine called Australian Shooter, and I'm now the back page column. So I've started mm. the back page column. So I'm now, uh, for, for that period of time up to this year, I've been what's a freelance. So I write and I submit. Um, that has, you know, that went from, for a period of time, I think I was like getting published once a quarter for about seven years to, you know, maybe 20, 30 articles a year across the spread of magazines, both in Australia and... Well, a fair Europe amount and, of articles, like 20, and, 30 articles. And globally, so yeah, globally. It's a fair, so, a fair uh, amount. Yeah, uh, again, so... <laughs> using my own man- measures, yeah, I'm probably a storyteller. Uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I tend probably. to see if 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 I was going to say not that I ever think that's about myself, but just when we're talking about this, if if I'm like if I if someone wants to say, hey Saul, like what's your like superpower or what's what you know what do you think you're you know kind of good at? I I feel like I or Maybe even things that I'm good at noticing, like I I noticed straight away why things that you were talking about. There's this very clear link between, you know, and an approach then to executive coaching, and then other things you do, and would be, you know, I'm I'm making assumptions here, but that that's like a um, something one that you really like doing. And that's like, you know, kind of core to your, you know, things that you obviously enjoy, things that you're, you know, a lens through which like you look at things you know, and look at the world. And I mean, I, I certainly relate to that too, because that's like, you know, uh, everyone loves a good story. That's that's universal. You know, that's kind of, mm. I think most people would agree if said, you know, everyone likes a good story. They're probably like, yeah, that's pretty true. You know, that's why people like movies. It's why a good, a well-defined, you know, thing with meaning and passion. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't have to have those things, but, you know, it brings meaning to, to, um, I guess, you know, living and to things. It's why, um, I mean, it's why I think generally podcasts have this amazing um, sort of popularity now and there's, you know, and some people, you hear this opinion around that there's that um, like audio and listening to podcasts specifically is, is uh, taking over more popular than watching or like watching and listening because one, there's kind of element of convenience, but you have these long form conversations that in themselves weave a story in a way that you can't, that you, well, not that you couldn't, but that you, um, in an organic fashion, in a different manner to something else that is either scripted or, you know, it sort of has has this flow, but it becomes its own story just by the nature of how it's how it's happening, and that's got a, like a completely different interest factor to people because it's like you're sitting in with them in their conversation, and I find that really fascinating. Like over the, and that's why. And yeah, I, I can always say that's why I like listening to podcasts that I listen to, is because it it feels like you're in the same room with those people and they're yeah. Chatting. If it's if if it's an inviting podcast, and obviously there's there's you know there's prerequisites on, True. on yeah, yeah, what yeah. you know content and things like that. Yeah, it's not every podcast. But that's right, but it certainly if it works, it feels like you are. And I mean, so as you know, so. I suppose to pivot back to the storytelling. So um, over the so I've I've been writing since two thousand and seven. Um, you know I'm in the fifth. I've got I've got every uh, behind me here is every magazine I've ever been published in, and it's well over a hundred now. Oh, nice. Um, um, and more recently, I've got into video, and uh, and and still photography was a huge part of that initial stage. Um, 
What interesting though, after about 10 years in, I stopped taking photos of myself. <laughs> and I noticed that the later articles very rarely features me. They feature the people I'm with or something like that. There is actually, you know, it's 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 not I'm not it's funny because I'm not in them almost type thing, you know. Uh so that that's that's obviously a um a, a, a slow progression there. But you know, look, so if you look at my writing, so uh, at base level, I do things like reviews, equipment, and so on and so forth. I do stories like hunting stories, or I do observational pieces of something like that. Um, but what I try to do, and everything I try to do, is I try to have a story in that. So I tried I, my. So sometimes my reviews have been criticised because they're not techy enough. But to me, you can find that anywhere. Um, so I try to write a story about a review, but one of the, I suppose, one of the great things that's that's come about after that this period of time is I'll get people who I don't know, and I will literally run into them on the street, and they'll go, "You helped me do something. Mm. You know, I wanted to try this. I didn't know how to try. It. I read you, and you helped me do it." And what that gave an idea to a couple, a few years ago now, a couple of years ago, was a good friend, Ian uh, Hurley, and another friend, Jonathan Steele. We started something called the Hunter's Campfire, which is a YouTube channel and uh, a Facebook page and an Instagram account. And what we did was we're all kind of the same idea is that it's this concept of that you're sitting around a fire and you're discussing things you're talking things and you know and it's and it is a campfire so there's a bit of bravado because that's what happens around a campfire and there is a bit of you know not not you know there is a bit of uh you know uh wordplay but there is what it is mostly or ultimately is there's a lot of discussion and learning and reflection and things like that and so our approach has been to create this thing called the Hunter's Campfire, where if you don't know or you're unsure, you can go and have a look and go, okay, that might help me start. And we've, like last year, we we actually kind of did a, um, for the Facebook page, if you look at the Facebook page, you'll see that the, the, um, the banner image is all these different photos of mm. people. And they're, there's both Ian, oh, sorry, there's Ian, John, and myself, not both. The three of us are in those photos. But everyone else is people we've helped that year. Right, right. So, And that's their success. And it's like, yeah, that's what we want to hear. We want to hear about your success. So, again, even in that instance, I'm storytelling. I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm telling stories um, about what I did, how I might go about it, what I learned from it, and things like that. So that storytelling theme runs through runs through all that the 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 um the rationale behind hunting is is much harder for me to 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 um to adequately describe and you know as i said often in in it because it's seen often as a, a controversial thing mm. which is odd um but anyway I, I try not to to dwell on that is that you tend to get into a conversation about um why you do it so you know it's it's you know you because it's feral 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 pests in australia so you're helping the natural environment there's the, the you know there's the, the the food part so you know you're not you're not relying on supermarkets for meat and things like that and, and yeah and you're gaming outside and there's lots of psychological studies that say it's actually you know it's it's you know it's how how beneficial it is psychologically for you and all and all these kind of things about you know challenging yourself and seeing plans but all of those are rationalizations they don't actually describe the why and and for me that's very difficult um even if someone wants to be, you know, and I've had it more than once before, someone wants to, you know, say something a little unkind and says, oh, well, you know, it's just bloodlust. Well, the reality is hunting on foot in a state forest or on public land is probably the least effective way <laughs> to actually find an animal. It's like, you know, it is it is that the, it, you know, I'm making it, it's so difficult, which is a great attractor to it, that you know it, it it kind of negates all those silly kind of statements, but I um I was I, as, as as you may imagine I wrote a little about the thought process recently and there was this, hmm. there was a meme on Facebook and of course memes describe everything in our lives now and I there was this <laughs> meme and it's that you know um uh 
that television show Family Ties. Yeah. You, you obviously know. The Father. Oh, with Michael Family J. Fox Ties. originally. Yeah. No, the fa- yeah, Michael J. Fox, but The Father, really tall oh, the, guy. Yeah. He did a movie later on called Tremors, which was this really kind of spoofy um, science fiction thing. I think I vaguely remember that. Yeah, and he's, yeah. he plays this kind of um, yeah. survivor nut up in the hills, you know, <laughs> in America, you know, and, and his, his, his life is guns and, and flags and stuff, and he helps fight this this monster because, you know, he's armed to the teeth. Of course. So yeah. it's a photo of him in that character, so he's got a big, you know, cheesy moustache <laughs> type thing. And there's a there's him, and then, then there's a photo of geese on the wing, and they're honking. And he's and then the next photo is he's looking up, you know, his eyes are up. And then there's a question that says, you know, what are you listening to? And he he answers smiling, nothing. And that resonated with me because, uh, and this is really hard to explain, is that. The natural world exists without our knowledge and our, without our consent. Mm. And if you're lucky enough to see that or hear that, you realize there is something greater than, than you know, the urban environment. There is a thing out there that is far greater than the ur- urban environment, which is the natural world. And more importantly, the natural world isn't like a it's not like our version of animals. It's not like we control it and so we create it. It actually exists mm. without, without you know, it exists. Aldo Leupold, um, who is a, a famous and fundamentally, you know, one of the the foundation foundational writers of, of conservation, wrote this piece on extinction once, and he wrote it about a, a type of pigeon in the US that was shot to extinction. They thought they would never end, and guess what? They did. They killed them all. Mm. And they've actually, in this particular town, they built this um, monument to the pigeon. And he's talking about that. And he said, um, the reality is if it happened to us, the pigeons wouldn't build a monument to us. Mm. And it was, you know, it was, they don't really, the natural world doesn't really have much concern for us other than, you know, one that to, 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 to keep our eye on our predacious nature mm. and also to, um, um, you know, take opportunity from us when we can, but they, they do their thing. So birds don't tweet for us. Birds mm. tweet for a wholly different reason. And if you're able to find that, and I found that hunting has allowed me to do that because you're so immersed, you're you know, so immersed in it that it's 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 fundamentally changing the way you see things. Is it is it true? Because I mean I've I've as like somebody, because I should say, like for people listening, I'm I'm not a I'm not a hunter. I'm I'm not into into the same sort of things. But it's for me, it's it's a really it's um it's not anything like I feel like I I do certainly understand like some some of the reasons why people do. I guess maybe some of that has been helped a little bit by listening to people like you know Joe Rogan too, who's Who's obviously a like he he um he speaks about that a lot, but I mean I I feel like I understand what you're saying. I mean, outside of the fact that um, animals like pigeons couldn't actually make a monument a a, a monument anyway with their little wings, but well, they could make, they could make a monument. But, that could be a big pile of pigeon poo. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We just wouldn't realize it's a monument. Uh, that's right. Well, we would be here. We would be a, here to see it. So that was the point. Yeah, that's right. We'd all be dead because that. I mean, I will have um, hunted us to extinction. <laughs> but like the fact, but yeah, it's it's. I think from from a human experience point of view, like I whilst I can't say that I've I've had had that same experience that you kind of is, is hard to put into, into words. I feel like I, I have had it through other experiences, certainly in nature, especially on our sort of property too. I was actually just talking about this with um, my wife the other day, we were talking about like this, um, like even probably in a less, a less extreme sort of manner than what you're talking about, but when you're like nearer to nature and just things from anything from the firsthand experiences you 
have with the the outside environment to um to like the lack of comfort that you're used to in in, in an urban environment to being like stung by or bitten by animals that you would usually not you know have have those experiences with it just it just expands for me anyway it sort of expands like being someone who loves you know animals and nature in general just just the whole shebang but also I guess it's kind of this contradiction that I feel like a lot of people have between that you can only love and experience it if you have the perspective that nature is um i'm sure there's plenty of unphilosophical uh writings on this that you know nature is pure and and sort of i'm fundamentally kind of like good and that we're bad you know as opposed to the perspective that you know it doesn't have to be one or the other that there's a lot of you know like i've i've you know, observed all the times so like we've been into one um, into insects and ants and various things and you look at the insect world like which is like amazing and is incredibly cool like observing ants and then i look at the fact that i can like mow over a gigantic meat ant nest which is huge which is like this colony this ravenous colony of of ants and they seem to disappear and then a short amount of time they come back and you look closely and they've been like rampaging over the whole yard, grabbing, you know, little, little worms and things and bringing them back in. And they're, you know, wholly um, ravenous because that's what they do. And it's not, and, and our, our projection onto that is, you know, we don't take it the same way as like maybe other mammals or things like a, a bear um, hunting a person but like you look at it closely and there's all these sort of similar correlations and it's it's incredibly interesting but also incredibly brutal there's you know these sort of aspects and I don't like I I feel like it, it's people often need to be they feel like they've got to sit on one side of the fence or the other and they have to take a stance on it. I mean, I don't yep. know. Like, do you feel like that's that's a almost definitely like so? Even by the fact that we're you know we're talking about hunting, there's going to be people listening who, who are going to draw conclusions from that. And yeah, no doubt. And once yeah. upon a time, I I I you know I try and I suppose present this in such a way to say that I could defend that, but I, I've come to the point mm. of a realization that that's probably not so important um you know getting back to your point about good and bad the, the interesting thing is good and bad is our is our projection onto those onto that mm. world you know there isn't a, we you know we do that we project the purity of nature and the evilness of man or vice versa and you know something like that mm. what i've what my observations have been is that these things don't exist um so um uh, for instance, um, in Queensland, we have a red deer population, which is seen as a, is a, as a pest animal. It was introduced in the 1800s. It was a gift from Queen Victoria to, to Queensland. And well, in fact, it was New South Wales probably at the time. It was still a part of New South Wales. Mm -hmm. And they were, they, were, they were released into the wilds and they, they, they survived. And if you think about that, that's you know like climate change like we've never <laughs> experienced ever you know you're you're in a mountain in scotland someone throws a net over you you're in a box and you wake up in the brisbane valley now hang on <laughs> surprise, but surprise. what what's happened is more even more more fundamentally interesting is that you know they within a very short period of time reset their whole breeding cycle to be 180 degrees out of the previous breeding cycle, and so they survive. So they started doing what they do, and they've and they've done that at least from from the end of the ice age. But a part of that that cycle is what's called the roar, where where the mat the stags vocalise a roar, amongst other things, mm. to for dominance to 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 attract hinds. And what happens is in a stag's life, for about 10 and a half months, you're a bachelor and you hang out with other stags and, you know, you kind of wander around and, you know, you 
you, you do what stags do. And then for about six months, six weeks of the year, you try to kill each other. You literally try and kill your best mate for, mm. for a competition for mates. Sounds and familiar. As, but it's only mm. it, it happens every year and it, it and it's 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 funny. So it's that's it. It does that. But if you're lucky enough to hear those rules, which I am, and they're going to start up in about four to five weeks, you realize that what you're hearing is something that has absolutely no nothing to do with you. Mm. No matter how important you feel that you are as a human, they have it's nothing to do with you. You you are you are you are an intruder. You are you know you're an interloper. And when you hear that and you hear the responses to it, you actually kind of, it, it, it's fundamentally, to me, it, to me, it's fundamentally changing because what it, it, it's like, yeah, these, it doesn't matter if I'm here or not. This is not happening for my, for my amusement, my pleasure, my learning or anything. It's actually nothing to do. I'm not even a, you know, a blip on the radar. So hearing that is, you know, and that's a part of what you what you experience. Um, so much so that, you know, and that is from a hunting point of view, that's peak hunting time. That is the peak hunting time. Why? Because mm. deer who are otherwise described as ghosts of the forest become, you know, goofy idiots. So they actually become quite easy to hunt. And um, I have on numerous occasions been sitting there in a paddock on dawn and gone, I'm not going to hunt today. I'm just going to listen to this. I'm going to, I'm because there is something happening around me that is fundamentally bigger than me in that it's, it's not even bigger than me. It's, it's actually just some, fundamentally um, something that's happening. It's, it's a wheel that's spinning that I have no influence over whatsoever. It's like so. when you hear something, something for the, I guess for the first time, like I've heard a lot of, um, you know, any any range of birds of which I don't really know offhand any of their actual proper bird names, but the ones that, that are, especially at night, um, for some reason, there's various birds like out on our property. And I heard one the other night and it was just really, um, I don't know what sort of bird it was, but it was like really, really eerie. But it was this amazing sound. Mm. This is really the shrill and was so loud because everything, because um, especially where we are, like there's there's some um, surrounding mountains and sound seems to echo like really powerfully. And I'm sure it wasn't anywhere near the house, but um, yeah, there's like something about the connection. Um, yeah, like you said, like it's got nothing to do with you, but your mind, or at least my mind does anyway, it's like, wondering what's the purpose like, like is it well, well that that's what we do why are they doing we do, it you know we try to they... interpret it we try to kind of go of course oh, we it, do it, yeah it, it's a mating call or it's a th-. you know what <laughs> it could be something fundamentally different to our interpretation and then we'll convince ourselves oh that's a you know a yellow valley sapsucker and it's currently talking to its <laughs> mate you know i mean and, and, and it might be. think that's not it might be, but you know yeah. what? It might not be. And that's the, the whole, well, a great example of that is the laughing kookaburra. And we, if you know anything about kookaburras, they're not laughing. That's actually a, a territorial statement. So yeah. they're not laughing at all. They're actually saying, hey, you, you know, go away. Yeah. But we call it laughing. So, you know, that, and that's, that's a kind of, you know, a, a great way of describing it. You know, when I talk to people, that I, I describe you know, that kookaburra, the laughing kookaburra, it's not laughing. Yeah, that's what we call it. We call it laughing. It's not laughing at all. It's yeah, it's, it's a it territorial. Like we're just relating. You know, that's right. We so know. we just relate it, and that, and I think sometimes that what we do is we over relate. So you know, we think, oh, you know, isn't you know, no bird, tr- no bird chirps for us. No, you know, they don't do it for us. Mm. If we weren't there, they'd be chirping. If they were there, we're chirping. You know, they might stop when they see us because they think, oh, predator. Mm. They might go, oh, hang on, but they don't do it for us. And I think uh, that's what I suppose my outdoor life has 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 allowed me to to be part of. That yeah, you know. yeah. No, it's it's really it's it's interesting. Like I like I said before, I mean, I'm I'm I could never see myself, you know, doing hunting or anything like that. But 
I do in one sense, like I do feel like I understand certainly why I mean, someone like yourself or, I mean, not everyone, because I know there's probably people who, who hunt, hunt for other, I mean, reasons yeah. too, you know, they, and, and I mean, some of it, I, I mean, like, I wouldn't know because I don't know anyone, I mean, I like that, but I mean, people do things for all sorts of reasons, you know, and what they do is their own business. But I mean, I can only, I can only sort of relate to probably very logical, practical things too. I mean, it's, it's certainly, um, you know, it's, I'm sure, uh, like if you look at most people's perspective on like the cane toad is like, um, the cane toad was introduced. It's like super hardy. Most people don't have, I mean, this is, uh, sure. I mean, some people probably disagree. I mean, I've, I've never done any like great harm to a cane toad because I haven't been hunting them. I haven't been like hunting down cane toads, but most people don't like with a cockroach, they don't have, um, a particularly fond view of the cane toad as opposed to their dog, you know, no, they well, go, that there is I'm going to look there after is. the cane toad. If, yeah. a, if they saw a cane toad that had sort of transpired, they're not going to be, Oh, you know, at least sad about that. You know, but the fact is that yeah, <laughs> there's, you know, things, things happen within nature that, you know, I mean, our nature is predisposed to, you know, feeling certain ways about some things that more relatable. I was actually just talking about this to um, um, Sunday the other day, we were talking about uh, fish, you know, saying, and I just sort of had this idea and I posed it to him. I said, do you think, it was sort of a creepy question or he thought it was creepy um, because then he was imagining like a smiling fish. I said, like if fish, if fish, if fish had more, expressive qualities like you know so like other mammals or other animals that people relate to more do you think people would be less inclined to fish if they caught a fish and they saw and the fish had had uh i was able to like express more pain or like anguish on his face and then he was it was like well i think it'd be really creepy like to catch a fish and, and see it smiling at you or like crying but well yeah, it would, but <laughs> the point was that, you know, not really that, but that our interpretation of things in general is like so closely related to our own worldview. Like we can't separate ourselves from that. You know, it's no, we like, can't. I mean, and it's and, like inextricably linked. One of the things that I, I've given up, and and I not because. I gave it up because of um, I, you know, I, I felt that I didn't have the, the the right approach. But one of the things I've given up is 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 one of the one of the troubles with this is that it, because it's controversial and people, or it can be controversial. It's not always. There's a lot of around the world. There's a lot of places where this is completely normal behaviour. Mm. And I always laugh when people say things like, you know, well, let's be more like Norway. Well, in Norway, you can hunt whale. So. Do you want to be like, you know, in Norway, you're able to legally hunt moose by driving them with a dog. So, you know, we, we, we it, you know, we, it's, we do that thing where we kind of, we shop for the answer we want. But a couple of points is that one, when we talk about, so when I talk about hunting, I'm talking about hunting on foot for a particular species um, of mm. game. And, my even as a very experienced hunter, my strike rate is probably sixty percent. So then you have things like pest eradication. So and this is for for many people, this is what they see hunting is that there's a feral population on a property, goats, pigs, whatever it is, foxes, rabbits, and there's a you know a wholesale destructive ex effort. Now I don't do that. Not that I don't do it because I think it's fundamentally wrong or something like that. It's just not, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the more immersive um, approach to a, a particular single animal, which I, I'm, I am hoping um, and climactic conditions play a part of this to actually harvest meat from that animal. Now I don't do it because for that 
that is not the sole reason. That's just one of the benefits of it. Another mm. benefit is that it actually does help maintain species populations on, on public and private land. But they're all kind of the benefits, and and I don't yeah. want to get well. It's interwoven. Yeah, no, I that's mean, right. Is, so yeah. well, um, that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about a very you know particular activity. Um, but there is, you know, the word hunting is is and, and shooting because often, often not, not always there's trapping and there's poisoning and there's all sorts of ways that we uh, we kill animals that we don't like. <laughs> there's whole mm. a whole reamer that we're we're quite good at it. Um, but there's those kind of components, and so for me, it it has become over time very much a philosophical um, idea. Um, so yeah. That's why it's almost very difficult for me to properly put it into words, which is probably one of the reasons why I write stories about it, because mm. it's easier for me to to do that than try to express the reasoning, you know, the, the philosophical reasoning behind it. But um, to your point about fish and all those kind of things, I, see, there's so many variables in that, you know, there's, uh, you know, it's it's how you're brought up. It's what you experienced as an adult. It's mm. it's um, how you understand about food and where food comes from. Mm. You know, there's so many variables in that. Um, you know, and then you get cultural variables. You know, there's there's places in the world where they eat animals that we don't want to eat. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and, and we kind of go, oh, it's horrible. that horrible? They're they're eating yeah. that animal, but they're not eating that animal. So you know, and so it's a it's it's a complex. Well, it's a human. It's a human. It's a, it's and then there's human. cannibals so it's very, as well, obviously. Hmm? There's what? Yeah, and then there's uh, people, although probably not that many of them around people that eat other people too. Well, as cultural, that's another thing altogether. Yeah, well, the, the, yeah. I, I, not, I mean, I, I'm assuming that that culturally that is on the decline. But <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, yes, well, if, if, if you do, if you do love your. Um, are you sci-fi? Uh, you, you understand about things like Soylent Green, you know, and things yeah, like that. Yeah, but awesome. strangely enough, but sort of ironically, yeah, I'm sure that's true, but you wouldn't know it. Like if an alien came to Earth and saw the amount of like zombie movies that, that people see, they'd probably be like, wow, that's like a pretty common thing because there's heaps of like weird looking people like eating other people. So you'd that's probably right. be thinking that's probably pretty normal. Like if that that's was right. one of the first pieces of, you know, fiction you came that's across, hilarious. you'd probably be like, oh, they're obviously obsessed by eating each other, hmm. <laughs> which isn't the case <laughs> at all. Or you at know. least being chased by others who want to eat you. Yeah. Who are it appears to be seemingly the impervious. The chases are fudge. It appears from the from you know, as an alien from the movies, it would appear from your the documentation of your planet's life, it would appear that the people who are doing the chasing are much more enthusiastic about it than the people that are being eaten. <laughs> yeah, but I'm not sure how, why that is. <laughs> however, our general observations, like outside of this uh, fiction that you're showing, is we can't really seem to find the zombies, so they must be living underground. You know, well, they must be those... seasonal. We just we just come at the wrong time. It's like <laughs> seasonal. It's seasonal. Yeah, yeah, that's right. They're like spread out <laughs> of the see. ground. Well, we'll, we'll be back next year. When should we return? What April, May? When's the best time to see this? Yeah, but it's like a funny. <laughs> it's like it's always funny saying things like that but the reality is too that like we all make out i mean i know i I'm, I'm sure i do you make all sorts of like you know broad judgments about about things and you go oh, i'm pretty open-minded and then you reflect on it and you go like i always thought this and then someone's like no nah, no nah, that's not no, that, like that, you yes. saying you're saying about like you know kookaburras it's always it's a very like generally culturally in Australia, it's like a really pleasant, you know, like, oh, wow, it's so great. You know, it sort of sounds really nice. I heard them the other day and it's like, oh, it's nice waking up in the morning to the kookaburras. But then the context Fighting. is, yeah. <laughs> Fighting. Fighting up. Yeah, it's like waking up in the morning. Well, but the kookaburras that. waking up in the morning to a bunch of guys fighting, like in that's their right. yard and going, and going, oh, wow, that's such a, I love the sound of all those men that's fighting. Right. That's right. Yeah. It's the dulcet tones of my neighbours fighting. Yeah, yeah, of of people screaming. And they go, ah, oh, that's awesome. I love that. It makes me feel relaxed. That's it. Like, so there's, there's, that's right. So there's that wonderful uh, 
interpretation and we may you know we may we may very well be wrong about that interpretation but after a while it becomes it becomes accepted it becomes accepted fact and then, then we're happy with yeah. it yeah yeah but you certainly like people see what they want to see I, I i saw thanks to the internet i mean yet again for showing me i'm sort of rubbish that i'm not searching for but still ends up being interesting is i saw that um snippet in a video of the thing which you may have seen is like there's like a bunch of different samples of like images of the same image but children see but children see a bunch of dolphins and adults see two like lovers it's, oh okay i have yeah, not seen that yeah there's there's a bunch of different um things and the point was that that you know it's obviously i i think the tools psychological tools too and i've seen these a few times but this particular one was um they were saying like as an adult you can't you can't see the dolphins and i was oh, actually okay. trying, yeah and you can't even see the dolphins but i was actually trying to see the dolphins because of course the video was saying i was an adult and that i couldn't see them so i was trying to see them and i actually couldn't see them i was like but i said but children then do the opposite they can't see the two people you know embracing but they just see only dolphins well that's what they've told you kids can see because you can't actually see that and so on so i so say you're saying it's a conspiracy good well no it could just be <laughs> fraud no the conspiracy is it could just be fraud oh, um so but yes, one will I, mean, know, but it, I, I think that uh, if we're going to give some kind of structure to this that perception is incredibly influential and how we how we perceive things either ourselves or those around us may give us a, an anchor on which to you know we can go forward but that's not necessarily a, a true anchor but still we we'll use it as such so there's i mean the, and that we get into bias and and really interesting conversations about bias which uh, i think is well it's certainly unfortunately taken a in many cases, a negative connotation, but I think understanding bias is really, really important. Mm. Um, and understanding what why you have certain biases and what those biases are are really important. And um, again, you know, and I think that this is what that this is whole conversation is about. Part of that is what is your bias? Why do you see? How do you see it? And why do you see it? And understanding what that is. Some of that, then, I guess especially this part of the conversation that we've been having about, about hunting then too, but even like any opinion that say you or I share that someone else doesn't share, then part of say, if you want to say um, either if there's any reason to have a reconciliation on that, or even maybe to very, very broadly with the, with the risk of sounding wishy-washy to make the world a better place like that somebody else, like part of that has to be that a person listening in to a, someone else sharing an opinion has to have first and foremost a willingness to listen. Yeah. And yep. it gets it gets back to like the willingness thing we were talking about before is that like you kind of can't, you can't move forward with anything unless there's at least, okay, I'm willing to, listen to something that my bias says I currently hate or I currently think is like evil or I currently think is great that somebody else thinks is not great. You know, mm. if if you can at least go where are they coming from, it doesn't mean as that assumption then too that that conversation would mean that you're leading to you changing your opinion, but it doesn't have to be that. Like it's just that it might open up another perspective that you didn't have you might still have the same opinion but it means that you maybe got a little bit closer to to having more insight like into the other person's story yeah i think what, what the takeaway from that isn't and, and something that I've, I've thought about is and um, in reflective of a lot of things is you don't have to be your opinion you know, your, your your opinion doesn't necessarily have to be your your your, your, your who you are. You know, you, you're you're a persona. You're who, however you want to describe that. You don't have to be that opinion. You can have an opinion, 
you don't have to be that opinion. I mean, and, you know, it's it, it's almost impossible to ignore the fact that, you know, this continuing kind of tribalism that we see around so many things, mm. which is interesting to me because, you know, and we talk about left wing and right wing and things like that. Well, once upon a time, not too long ago too, that is that if you voted a certain way, you weren't that. That was just how you were voted. Mm. You know, I'm I'm me and I vote Labor. Mm. But but it's become I am Labor. You know, it's like you you're actually identifying something that technically happens once every three to four years, you know, as you. So, uh, you know, and to me, you're far more complex than your single political view or or any any view. And obviously certain views are reprehensible and, and we have to draw a line under those ones. But mm. for the vast majority of people, your opinion is your opinion. And if you share it with someone and they don't like it, you may have a conversation about it, but again, in in again, the vast majority of cases, surely we can uh, we don't need to change our opinion. No, if your opinion uh, is you know if you know and uh, you know and you can be flipping around it or whatever it is, but you know you can if someone has an opinion about uh, you know religion, for instance, you know their their belief is there is God and it's a Christian God. Um, now, as a person and about how they express that, that's obviously really important. But that in itself, and I'm not now talking about actions, but I'm talking about that, that someone who holds that opinion, that's their opinion or belief or whatever you want to describe it. And so they, mm-hmm. it's not my role to try and change them. And, again, uh, coming back to, um, you know, the way I approach things, I want to tell you a story and I'm hoping that there is some learning in for you in that story, but it's not like, you know, the story doesn't start, thou shalt now obey. You know, it's not that it's, it's, it's about engaging and, and, and having people if they want and they see something for them in learning from it. And uh, I, you know, this idea of, you know, competing opinions is great because what else are you going to talk about? You know, you know, talk about the fact that everyone <laughs> well, loves vanilla, that's right. everyone loves vanilla ice cream. Well, you know, and and, yeah. and politically, you know, there's a, you know, there's the left wing and the right wing, but we all know that a bird can't fly with with only one wing. You know, and if you've ever been in a boat with one oar on one side, all you do is go around around in circles. Mm. Um, so there's those, you know, there's you, those metaphors again, Mark. That's it. I can't help it. That that just that just keep. <laughs> They just keep oozing out of you. <laughs> That's it. They keep coming. <laughs> As long, and, and obviously, I'm still uh, cogn- You know, the, the the cognitive faculties are still working enough that I'm not mixing them. What? <laughs> That's right. When you start going downhill, you start mixing your metaphors. Yeah, but that's. Yeah, but that's you do realize that's only because you're so excited that you've got so many. You just yes, can't. maybe that's you what just it is. Can't, you, got- you just can't process it, and you don't so have the many- skill. There's so many metaphors. You just that's want to mix them get all out. up. That's so the ultimate. Waiting, that's like I'm just waiting for metaphor. you to give me the. I'm just waiting for you to give me that chance in the conversation for me to jump in and just start start writing the metaphors down. <laughs> well, I'll give you. I'll give you a little a little chance here. You can always inject one in in this this quote that I'm going to squeeze out of you. So if you okay. want to, so. Um, I said before that generally at the end, like of all these podcasts, I sort of say to people, um, I mean, there's a lot of things we've spoken about, but quite like even, even that you like, there's like such, I don't know what the attraction is about quotes. Maybe it's part of that whole storytelling thing. It's like a little tiny, like tweet from Twitter version of like a story. There's like, you know, quotes is sort of this, Grab. So, have you got something that that you really like um, that you want to share? I've got millions of them. Just one. I'm, I'm literally, <laughs> I'm literally trying to put them in some kind of order. So, um, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna ask. I'm just gonna say it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna steal a space. So, my, I've got two, and one is that uh, for those people listening, um, 
is that um and those listening don't realize that you and i can see each other and but this is an old audio only presentation is that um i i quoted a gentleman before by by the name of aldo loophole i suggest people if you can look him up and look at some of his quotes because they are truly insightful but there is one particular story piece he wrote called think like a mountain and it talks about his learning and realization of the point uh, of the place of of all, of all animals within an ecosystem and specifically he's talking about predators um it's a it, and it's called think like a mountain and, it, and the idea is that you know we as humans think in very short periods of time mountains think differently um and we need to maybe it's we we can we can learn from that the second one i think is really uh is a short quote and it's actually on my computer so it's probably the one I should share with you. I have it on my computer. So you'll you'll have to say it out loud because yeah, I will. But I, I just uh, yeah, I, I'm showing it to you so people listening know that I'm actually saying. So this is not made up. It's I've made like a little you know a little um, you know like a, a cardboard triangle like a like that you might have on a desk to show your name or your title, and it sits on top of my computer. And the inspiration of this uh, great quote is the, the uh, that television series Serenity and and the movie Firefly. So you know it, it's it's real high high brow, but I, I love it. It is, I am a leaf on the wind. Watch how I saw. Yeah. Exactly, I like a good that, cliche. You know why? That, because there that's are one of my favorite. That's one of my favorite quotes. <laughs> No, but it's true. Like I, there's, there's the, or maybe it's an Australian thing too, but there's, there's often a dumbing down of like, especially really cliched cliches, but they're often just really good and they're really true. And there's a, but, but they're like so true and used so often that people are like, Oh, I've heard that a lot, but it still, it still remains that that is true. So as, as we're, reaching the climax of this podcast, Mark. Yes. So as we're reaching the climax, how do you, how would you um, like for people to, um, to find out more about um, all the various things that you get up to from, um, you know, the podcast or the different sure. videos, give people like a, a uh, just a bit of a um, overview with um, your URLs okay. or however you want. So yeah, if you'd like to, uh, so I have a couple of URLs uh, for uh, one is my my own business URL, which is um, cdiconsulting.com.au. If you're particularly interested in talking to me about executive coaching, uh, you can find my 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 mug and my bio on Executive Central Group. Um, which is uh, so executivecentral.com.au and just look for Mark Van and Bogart in the team. You'll see a photo of me and, and the other people I work with in the executive uh, coaching space. Um, if you're interested in uh, my outdoor life, uh, probably the best place to start is on The Hunter's Campfire on YouTube. And that's, as it says, The Hunter's Campfire. Um, and uh, just so you know, if you think you, there might be more than one name throw up, the little, uh, I suppose, emblem is, uh, is it's a campfire with the word <laughs> the Hunter's Campfire around it. So it's pretty obvious. <laughs> sense. And you'll also find the Hunter's Campfire podcast on Facebook and you'll also find the Hunter's Campfire podcast on Instagram and you'll also find the audio versions because we have both audio and video versions of the podcast on YouTube, but we'll find the audio only versions of the podcast. That is the Hunter's Campfire podcast, um, wherever you get your, you know, um, uh, audio podcast. So Spotify, like Spotify. Google, iHeartRadio, uh, Pod, uh, Podbeam, all those ones. We're out there yeah. in, the, in the moments. And it's generally uh, one and a half to two hours of, of people just talking about stuff, yeah. like all good podcasts, like all good podcasts. Like we're doing. like like Just like this great podcast. Yeah, that's it. And you can ignore all the other uh, search results for the other 
Mark Fenton Bogart, who's some yeah, Dutch, they're, they're, um, soccer player. Uh, yes, because <laughs> I get him. I, I get I get frequent um, requests to connect on LinkedIn from people in Holland. I didn't realize there was another Mark Fenton Bogart and, <laughs> and Facebook. I was like I searching and, was, and he was everywhere. He's like some a, soccer player. I get him on Facebook and I'm kind of going, <laughs> who is this person? Ah, oh, it's in Holland. <laughs> ah, that's probably what it is. Yes. Yeah, yes. yes. Uh, that's it. That's it. So thank you once again, a good friend for the, um, for hopping on the podcast. Great as always. And um any last words? Uh, other than say thank you for the for the hour and a half of or, or even more hour and forty minutes of the opportunity to ramble and to you know tell tell tall tales and speak about stuff that I I, I really enjoy probably more enjoy uh, yeah. I, you know that that's part of who I am and what I really like to do. Uh, appreciate that. I uh, appreciate your time and. Um, for those who don't know, Saul and I do this on a regular basis, but there's usually beer involved. So this has been a dry <laughs> event. So yeah, we usually I'm not sure way. if that may, makes it better or worse, but either either way, it's certainly been an enjoyable and again, so yeah. I've, I've very much appreciated your the your attentive nature and asking me questions that make me think. Yeah, no, always always explain talking about things very eloquently as well. So thanks, Mark. And, not um, bad for a for a from from a boy from Petri Terrace, huh? <laughs> not bad at all. And so, with that in mind, that's actually it for today, guys. Um, thanks so much for listening into our podcast yet again. Before we go, please leave your feedback as well if, as as well if you like, as well as any suggestions for any topics you would like us to discuss in future episodes. And thanks again for listening to the Grey Business Podcast. And we'll see you again soon. Bye, guys. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode of Grow Your Business. Have a great day and we'll see you next time here at the Grow Your Business podcast.